I hope you join me today and you stick with me for uh, this fascinating journey of typologies uh, in the Old Testament, actually from the book of Exodus, regarding Jesus, his church, and uh, the redemption of the remnant after the tribulation, at the end of it, and the rapture of the church, the second coming, all this from the Old Testament, uh, and I'm sure it will be a blessing to you. When we talk about Moses, usually uh, we talk about his early life, how uh, as a child uh, he was put in the basket in the river Nile by his mother, found by the daughter of the Pharaoh who adopted him, uh, how he grew up there and then at age 40 um, killed an Egyptian guard, had to flee to Midian where God met him again 40 years later. Uh, in the burning bush and from there he returned to lead the people out of Egypt, the famous Exodus. Um, but today I want to zoom in on a specific period in his life um, where he was um, leaving Jeth Jethro, where he served for 40 years as a shepherd, um, went to, uh, uh, Egypt, back to Egypt and the early stages of the Exodus. And in that I want to focus maybe more on uh, Moses' wife, uh, Zipporah, and in a lesser extent uh, on his father-in-law, Jethro, more than on Moses himself. So just um, to refresh our minds, uh, how did Moses end up uh, with Jethro in Midian to begin with? Uh, I want to read that first, and that is from Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 21, where it says, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing regarding uh, Moses slaying one of the guards, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. And she bare him a son. And he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now this may seem just summing up some um, facts uh, so that we know what happened, but there is a whole different layer of meaning in here. There are a few things um, that we, we note. First of all, it speaks about Midian. And so when you hear about an area or a place, it's always good to check the map and to see what is it talking about. So uh, I uh, underline it here on the map. Uh, Midian is the area... Uh, east of uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, east of the Sinai Peninsula, um, and um, it was named Midian after the first tribe that settled there. And this was the, the leader of that tribe, obviously, was Midian. Now, who was Midian? Um, this was son, actually, of Abram and uh, Keturah. Now, uh, Abram, uh, of course, uh, his wife was Sarah, um, but after Sarah died, we can read in scripture, uh, he had um, uh, uh, more sons with Keturah. 
Um, we can read this in Genesis 25. So I, I made this uh, diagram. Um, the way you can see this, uh, so you see in the center uh, top there, Abram, and then you see a line to his wife, Sarah. And um, with uh, Sarah, of course, he had his son, Isaac, who had a son or two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob being Israel, and um, Jacob had 12 sons. These uh, are 12 original tribes of Israel, as you can see in the diagram. But we know also that um, before Isaac uh, was actually born, um, Abraham had a son with Isma, with Hagar, um, his, uh, his, his handmaid, and that was Ishmael. And Ishmael also has uh, had 12 sons. Um, now, um, that's not interesting or not, not related to this story, but just to, to give a complete picture. Uh, I listed them there and I put a little asterisk uh, with the second one, Kedar, because Kedar, uh, the tribe of Kedar, um, is from where um, Mohammed came. And so this is actually the root of um, um, the Muslims from Abram, Ishmael, Kedar. Um, and then after Sarah died at age 120, and Abram was even older at that time, he uh, had another wife called Keturah. Um, and with Keturah he had six more sons. And all this is in scripture. And um, one of them uh, is Midian, who in turn also had uh, five sons. But okay, then that's uh, beside the point. So there we find Midian. And... Um, I just put as an extra side note there that his uh, second son with Keturah, uh, Yoksan, had two sons by the name of names of Sheba and Dedan. And that's interesting because we find Sheba and Dedan back in uh, Ezekiel 38. Um, and um, that is actually the current area of Saudi Arabia. So we have an idea of how things are related there. So the Midianites were, uh, in fact, uh, cousins of the Israelites, of the sons of Jacob. And so the Midianites first settled there, east of the Jordan, and later they became uh, nomadic people uh, in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, just as another side note, it were uh, Midianite traders that lifted Joseph out of, uh, out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. And it's kind of ironic if you think of it. Let's read this uh, verse in Genesis 37, 28. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So you see that Midianite traders, descendants of Abram and Keturah, lifted Joseph out of the pit, Joseph from Abram and Sarah, uh, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites, which were descendants of Abram and Hagar. So, um, yeah, ironic, you can say. Now, later, the Midianites, together with the Moabites, turned against Israelites, uh, Israel, and uh, God would then tell Moses to destroy them. Uh, that's in Numbers 31, um, which he was unable to do completely. And um, God would then later use the Midianites as judgment against Israel. So that's a bit of backstory about Midian. Um, so that's where um, Moses ends up with uh, a man named here Ruel. And um, you would think, hey, that is a name I haven't heard before. Uh, Ruel or Raguel. Um, in Hebrew, it's written like this. Um, Ruel. And it means Ruel. Um, friend of God. Um, now, that was not really his name, as we will find out later, but it was more a nickname, or you can say title, um, because he was a priest. It says in the text that we just read, Exodus 2, that he was the priest of Midian. Now note that it says the priest of Midian. It doesn't say a priest. 
He was the priest. He was the man to go to if you had to deal with God, with any God. Uh, he was a universalist. He worshipped all the gods. Um, and so that's why it says Ruyel, uh, not Ruya. If it was Yah, it was Yahweh. It would have been the God of Israel. But um, actually, um, he didn't really know the God of Israel yet. This will come later. Ruyel, El is a more generic name of for, for God. can be any God. So later he would acknowledge that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. We, we get to that in a minute. And initially he was not loyal uh, to God because, as we also will find out, um, Moses' second son um, was not circumcised. And of course, if uh, Jethro would have been a true priest of God, he would have demanded his grandson to be circumcised. So that's about Jethro here named Ruel. I get back to this name. And it says he had seven daughters. Now, when you read that, you have to stop right away. Alarm bells begin to uh, to sound because seven daughters, not five, not eight, not any other number, but seven. And then you have to think, of course, of the seven women in Isaiah 4, verse 1, or the uh, seven churches, actually, in Revelation 2 and 3. The seven daughters are a type of the seven churches. Um, and this is important to recognize because Zipporah, is one of them and see it typifies the church the body of christ the true church um, the bride of christ she is the bride of moses moses uh, typifies christ in this whole story most of the times at least and um well it, it will come out um, more clear now zipporah let's also write down uh, her name Sepora is written like this, and um, it can go two ways uh, meaning-wise. It can come from the word uh, Sepor, which is a bird, a little bird. Um, that means that you have to leave out the he at the end and put the yod in between. Or it's from the word Sapar, which means to pierce through, which is simply the first letters here, so without the he. And this is the meaning I uh, lean towards. Um, first of all, because it's literally in there. You don't have to add any other letters. Um, and here we see that the he is added, just like in the name Abram, which was originally Abram, the he is added, and Sarah E changes to Sarah. The he is added, and the he is the, um, the, uh, the, the number five, eh? um, uh, Grace. So, which fits if she is the church, but it also means, therefore, to pierce through. And, of course, that is important because that points directly to Jesus who was pierced through. Um, so, um, yeah, an interesting meaning there. Um, what we also read is that Moses stands up, he defends the seven daughters against the shepherds that want to drive them away. Uh, and that shows Moses' compassionate heart. He simply uh, cannot stand um, injustice, uh, unrighteousness. We saw the same when he, he, um, he attacked this, this uh, Egyptian guard. It's the injustice that he cannot stand. And that is really characteristic, of course, of the Messiah. We see it here. Uh, if you think of the seven daughters being the seven churches, it is really Jesus defending his churches, his church, uh, I should say. Um, he comes up for them, he defends them, and um, not only that, then he pours water and he feeds the sheep. Uh, it could not be more beautiful a typology there. He provides them the water of life. This is how he feeds his sheep while he keeps away the false shepherds. Now, these daughters, they were taking care of the sheep and uh, Moses would then, of course, become a shepherd um, there in Midian um, for 40 years. Now, the profession of shepherd was actually simple and um, low in, in society, so to speak. Uh, but we see that God um, works with the low and with the humble. 
we see that Abram was uh, having sheep, um, though he was a rich man, but um, he was still um, having sheep uh, and holding sheep. That was what he did, and so did his sons and uh, his descendants, actually, Isaac and Jacob. And um, the first king of Israel, King Saul, was a shepherd. The second king of Israel, King David, was a shepherd. And it goes down through history. And then, of course, we learn to know Jesus as the good shepherd, calling us his sheep. And uh, even the first uh, men that uh, hear of Jesus' birth uh, are shepherds abiding in the field. So Moses uh, gets into uh, Jethro's house because Jethro says uh, to his daughters, call him, and that he didn't mean take your phone and call him, but go out and find him and, and bring him here. And so he's invited in the house and um, he is already identified by the daughters as an Egyptian, probably from his clothing, um, and maybe he had also a certain accent, um, I don't know, um, but it's very possible. Um, one could wonder what he would have said to Jethro. Would he have told him that he had killed a man and that he was a refugee? Uh, that he was a prince of Egypt? Probably not, or not right away anyway. But no matter what, um, he became a simple shepherd. Now, we find out later that he would call his second son uh, Eliezer. And Eliezer, uh, because he says, God delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Eliezer means helper of God. Now, um, what does he mean when he says, because God delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh? It can be twofold. Uh, first of all, and that's probably the most prevalent, is um, that he was saved as a baby in this basket uh, in the river. Um, and he was saved from being killed. But he was also saved from Pharaoh, of course, when he fled and ended up in Midian. Uh, so he was saved from the sword of Pharaoh twice. So uh, that could have um, also um, given an explanation to his family there in Midian and what had happened. But what's inter interesting in this is that he says, uh, Eliezer, because God delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. We read this, by the way, in Exodus 18, verse 4. Uh, because God delivered me. He recognizes the hand of God in all of this. And so he was a shepherd for 40 years until God met him through the burning bush. Interesting side note there also. We're not going to read all the verses, but in Exodus 3 verse 2, it says the angel of the Lord met him. Not God, the angel of the Lord. And then um, this angel of the Lord begins to speak through the burning bush. And then a few verses down in verse 6 says, I am God. So it's an angel of the Lord, but it's God. So this gives to think that um, this must be actually Jesus. Because Jesus is in the Old Testament uh, several times referred to as an angel of God. Not that he is an angel, but an angel in Hebrew uh, uh, is messenger. Uh, the messenger of God. Uh, someone who comes to deliver a message. So don't think literally of an angel like Gabriel and Michael, etc. Uh, but when he says, I am God, and take off your shoes, this is holy ground, then this shows that, um, that he is actually part of the Godhead and not any angel for that matter. Um, he must be God himself. But since he's referred to as the messenger of, it might have been Jesus himself. Moses uh, sort of uh, had God put on uh, had, had put God on the on the back burner, uh, as they say, because uh, he was living there for so many years with a pagan uh, priest, and um, as we find out, his second son, his younger son, he had not circumcised him. Um, so um, the importance of God and, and the covenant with God had gone to the background, but God had not forgotten forgotten him. And actually the rest of Moses' life would be all and only about God and with God. And after many objections, Moses takes up the mission to return to Egypt. That is what we read in Exodus 4, verses 18 through 20. There it says, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee. 
and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So, we note a few things again. First of all, Jethro is now called Jethro, and not Reuel. And uh, the name has uh, changed, uh, sort of. Um, the name used here is, uh, is Jether in Hebrew, which is written like this. Jether. And um, this means uh, re remainder or remnant. Interesting uh, name, uh, we will see. Um, and it at this point uh, in the narrative, it can refer to several things, namely now begins the remainder of J Moses' life, this third period of 40 years. Um, it can also be that um, it's the remainder of his uh, children, uh, grandchildren that, um, that are leaving now. Um, we don't know that, of course, but it's very possible. Um, or the fact that he remains uh, with uh, with the rest of his family while uh, Moses, Zipporah, and the children leave. But there is another deeper meaning to this. I get to that uh, a little bit later. Now, um, when it says that Moses put them on the donkey, uh, this um, it's a bit of a conjecture, but most probably um, the them are Zipporah and Eliezer. Zipporah. Uh, his wife and Eliezer, um, his youngest son, who must have been a, a baby or a toddler at that point. Um, and Gershom was uh, a young boy, um, and most probably uh, Gershom and Moses were walking while Zipporah and Eliezer were on the donkey. And it says that he had um, in his hand, Moses had the rod of God. Now, what is the rod of God? This was simply the rod that he had used uh, uh, during his shepherding. As every shepherd uh, had a rod and a staff. But it is called the rod of God. When God spoke to him through the burning bush, um, God showed him a um, sort of preview of what he would uh, do with uh, be in front of the pharaoh and told Moses to throw this rod on the on the ground and it turned into a serpent and when Moses touched it it turned back into a rod and through this uh, rod many miracles uh, would be uh, wrought later on uh, in Egypt and during the exodus and so uh, it is referred to as the rod of god so they are on the way back from Midian to Egypt. And on the way to Egypt, something strange happens. And this we read in Exodus 4, verse 24 and 20, through 26. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art, because of the circumcision. Now it says, by the way of the inn, the word inn is, uh, yeah, don't take it too literal. Uh, it's not uh, like uh, a medieval inn. It's most likely just a designated resting place along trading route that they were traveling. No matter what, um, there are a few questions that, uh, that raise here when we read this. First of all, how did Zipporah know that God wanted to kill Moses? Secondly, what actually happened to Moses? Apparently, he cannot speak, he cannot move. He's actually as if he's already dead. He's totally incapacitated. And thirdly, how did Zipporah know what the reason was why God wanted to kill Moses and what she needed to do. None of this is explained in the text, 
Actually, this is a very enigmatic text and um, different Bible expositors and scholars have different explanations for it. What do we know? We know that God the Father wanted to kill his son. I say it this way on purpose. The husband, the groom, the husband of Zipporah, which, which is typified, of course, by Moses. Moses is a type of Christ. It's God the Father who wants to kill his son. Uh, why? Because of the sin of Zipporah. Often this is explained as the sin of Moses because he had not circumcised his, his son, the second son, Eliezer. And, of course, there is truth in that, but it goes deeper. Why had he not um, circumcised his son? He had circumcised his first son. Um, and for sure, he wanted to do the same for his second son. But most likely, it was his wife who had withheld him from doing that because she saw uh, the bloody ritual at the first time and the crying baby, her child, and she didn't want to go through that again. And so she most likely, uh, and I can say actually, in my uh, opinion for sure, she was the one who... Um, who decided that the son should not be circumcised. Um, this was the sin, to not obey God. And uh, because of her sin, of the sin of the bride, um, the, the husband had to die. And so now she repents from that. She knows exactly I should have uh, allowed my husband to do uh, what he had to do. This was the covenant we were under. Um, and so that's why she knows exactly what's wrong and she knows also what to do. She repents and now she performs the bloody ritual herself, um, clearly showing her repentance. And she accepts the blood as a reparation, as an atonement, by casting it at Moses' feet, his feet it says, some say this is um, uh, Eliezer or even Gershom, but it, it must be Moses. Casting it at his feet or touching his feet with it is like a sign of bringing an offering, a sacrifice. Um, and what happens? Immediately Moses comes back to life. It says, God let him go. He let him go. Immediately whatever was on Moses to, to incap incapacitate him, uh, was now lifted, and he comes back to life. He is resurrected, as it were. Through Moses' death and resurrection as a type of Christ, and through the shedding of blood, the bride is saved. Here, Zipporah is, is converted. She repents, she accepts the blood sacrifice, uh, and, um, and she is saved. That is what we see here. And it's actually... It's, it's uh, a beautiful uh, typology here. It's very deep, if you think, it, think of it. Um, and just to, to connect it with the New Testament uh, even more, if we read Romans 3, verse 23 through 25, um, 23, of course, we know very well, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. It was really the forbearance of God that the past sins of Zipporah were here washed away by the blood. And you can say in a way, this was Moses' blood. It was his son, his flesh and blood. And she calls him a husband of blood. A husband of blood. Jesus to us is a husband of blood, you can say. As also is clear from this verse in Romans. The true church, the body of Christ, is saved by the blood. And the blood, as Jesus says himself during the Last Supper, it's a sign of the covenant. It's the blood of the covenant. It doesn't stop there. Now the... Moses continues and he, they end up in Egypt and things begin to unfold and uh, God makes clear what is going to happen. Moses realizes the intensity of the mission. He knows about the plagues that would follow. He knows about the danger of the exodus that God has hardened the heart of Pharaoh. 
And he does something that is actually very sensible. Something that is not in the text, but that is still in the text in another way. <laughs> Sounds mysterious, it is in a way, but it will become clear. God had made clear that he would pour his judgment on Egypt. And Moses is moving his wife and children out of harm's way. And he sends them back to Midian. Would not any caring husband take his wife and children to safety? It's a rhetorical question. Remember, Moses is a type of Christ and Zipporah of the church. And you can say the children are the members of the church. Now the son, Jesus the son, will call his bride home to his father's house. Literally, Zipporah goes back to her father's house. Uh, while the inhabitants of the earth, the earth, the world typified by Egypt, will be punished. It's a clear type here of the pre-tribulation rapture. The church is sent back or is sent to the Father's house while all these events take place. Now, In this way, uh, Moses could also fully focus on his people. Just as God, during the seven-year tribulation, will focus on his people as well. So then the plagues happen and the miraculous exodus takes place, the parting of the Red Sea. Of course, this news travels fast throughout the region. And it takes only days that this reaches Jethro. And Jethro hears of it and he takes Zipporah and the children and goes to meet Moses. And this we read in Exodus 18, verses 1 through 6. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Geshom. For he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And the name of the other was Eliezer. For the God of my father, said he, was mine help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, am come unto thee, and thy wife, and her two sons with her. So here we read that Moses indeed had sent um, Zipporah and his children back. So we don't read it where we would expect it in the narrative, but we read it afterwards when they return. So it is a clear, a clear fact. Um, this whole event here typifies the return of the church, of the bride, after the wrath, after um, the, the tribulation, you can say, because the tribulation of Israel in Egypt is, has come to an end. Um, so after that, the church returns. And Zipporah is escorted back, in this case by, by the father, by, um, by Jethro. And you see that the roles are somewhat... Um, reversed uh, you can say because we know that the saints will return with jesus we know this from revelation 19 from zechariah 14 and from the book of jude where the prophecy of enoch is quoted three times in the scripture it says this literally they meet at the refadim it says and um, i circled that also on the map so you can see where it is and you see that actually uh, in a straight line it's very near to Midian. So it's very possible that they took um, a boat to cross uh, the Gulf of Aqaba and they would be uh, very fast um, uh, in, in Rephadim where the children of Israel had camped. Uh, this was um, before Moses received the law. That would happen days after this, uh, as we can, can read uh, in the narrative. Um, so it was all within the 50-day time since the Exodus. And, and I put this in this uh, timeline, um, and that you, by the way, you can download it uh, from our website, uh, as well as many other um, materials. 
And this is a very helpful um, tool um, to, to uh, see the relationship between different things. And uh, among that, uh, between um, the Exodus and uh, the events uh, um, during the last phase of Jesus' um, life on earth. So it was within this 50 day period, which 50 days from the Exodus until the giving, first giving of the law, the Matin Torah. And um, we don't know exactly how many days, but it could well have been seven weeks since Zipporah had left. I, I think it should actually be because uh, God is perfect and uh, the seven weeks would then point to the seven years between the rapture and the second coming because that's what her departure and her return um, signify and typify. Now, it doesn't still end there. Um, it gets better and better. Jethro is now convinced that God is true and that he is above all the gods, all the gods that he used to worship. And we read it in Exodus 18, verse 10 through 12. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came, and all the elders of Israel, to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Blessed be the Lord, Jethro says. Um, Baruch Yahweh is what it says in Hebrew. And um, it's interesting, um, I was reading this and thinking... Uh, and some of you who, with whom I exchange emails sometimes know this, that sometimes I put below the email Baruch Hashem, God bless. But um, reading this, I realized actually this is not correct because Hashem means the name and um, Jewish people say this because they don't want to pronounce Jesus or God's name. Uh, um, but uh, actually God has never said that. On the contrary, when Moses asked God's name, he said Yahweh, I am who I am. Uh, this is how he wants to be called. And so here uh, Jethro says literally, in the, the, you can find it in the original Hebrew text, uh, Baruch Yahweh. And this should actually be the, the correct way to write it. So if ever I write it again, I'll, this is the way I will write it. Anyway, um, Moses, uh, Jethro's name changes once more um, and now becomes not Jether as before, but Jethro. So Jethro. Um, basically, it means that the Vav is added at the end. And this means his abundance. It can also be mean his remnant. Or his abundance. And um, we don't actually see these name changes in, um, in scripture. What we know, of course, first is uh, Ruyel. Uh, we read that. And um, other than that, we just uh, read Yetro, the last one. Um, so how do I say or how do I know um, that, that this is so? I don't know for sure, actually. Uh, this is oral tradition and it is written down uh, later in the Midrash. Uh, so it's, um, you can take it with a grain of salt if you want. Uh, but um, what is always interesting to me is that so many um, uh, typical Jewish traditions actually point to Jesus. And I'm sure that God has his hand in this and made it this way so that, um, that the Jews actually can discover Jesus in their own writings and traditions even. Um, it becomes Yetro because the Vav is added. And the Vav, Vav, literally the word Vav in Hebrew means nail. It's a symbol of the nail also. Jesus, the one who is pierced um, 
that's the one who brings salvation also to Jethro, as uh, he did to uh, Zipporah. So, so yeah, beautiful things in there. Um, you, we see in Jethro's name that being a friend of God um, does not bring bring anything. Many people in the world say they they are friends of God. They believe in God, uh, whatever, whichever God that may be. Um, but it's easily said and often said. Uh, but that does not bring anything. Jethro had to get rid of all the false gods. And then face the remainder. He had to see Christ, God's salvation. And that is what Yeshua means, Yehoshua, God's salvation. And that is typified by this nail, by this vav that is added to his name. And his own daughter testified of this. He gave name to his own daughter, Zipporah, to pierce through. Um, the daughter that had to come to, to perform this blood ritual um, to make the blood of the covenant pour out and um, um, see her, her husband, her savior, resurrected. Um, it's all in there. And um, so you get his abundance. Now, Jetter means remainder. It can mean also, Jetro can also mean his his uh, remainder or his remnant that makes it more interesting because in that Jethro here who plays uh, a double role you can say in this in this play he also typifies the remnant of God's people the remnant of Israel um, be, because he comes on the scene later at the end of 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 everything, he comes on the scene and he is saved. The remnant of, of God is uh, is saved in the in the second half, uh, actually, of the uh, tribulation period, as we, we understand from Zechariah 12 and uh, Revelation 12. And um, they will see uh, the Messiah at the end, at his second coming, which we uh, can uh, read in uh, Isaiah as well, of course, as in uh, Revelation. Um, so, so that's what happens here. He, it's in his name, and it's in the the sequence of events that we see here. Uh, but his name also means his abundance. This is the abundance of God. Um, God is sufficient in Christ. Actually, he is abundant in Christ, the blood husband, who will uh, take the bride out of harm's way. And keep her safe in her father, in her father's, uh, in his father's house, uh, um, as we can also read in Isaiah 26. By the way, all concealed in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, "I will show you a mystery," and he begins to to reveal this. But we see here in this story uh, marvelous uh, typology. Um, of, of this whole sequence of events. It's really beautiful to read this and to see this, this deeper level of meaning of what God is doing here and is foreshadowing here. Uh, so I really hope uh, that, uh, that uh, you're um, as much in awe as I am about all this and um, think about it, ponder on it, read these uh, scriptures uh, and see the connections for yourself. And um, Lord willing, uh, we'll look also uh, next uh, next time uh, at Moses and um, and the end of the age. Uh, and it's it's really actually astonishing how much of all this um, points to the the time we live in right now, to the end times, the end of the age, the rapture, the return of Jesus. Um, so there's more to come, um, but for now we we'll leave it at this. Thank you for uh, for listening and watching and uh, see you next uh, in the next video. Amen. Mm -hmm.